Commissioner, you're good to go whenever you're ready. Okay, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I wish she was here. Those were the good old-fashioned <laughs> laptops, you know? I know, but old paper. Okay, it is 9.30. I will convene the uh, January 28th meeting of the Public Disclosure Commission. We have a quorum here. Uh, and uh, first item on the agenda is citizen comments. I don't see any in the audience. Any citizens in the audience? Are there any comments for us? Hearing none. Go on to commissioner comments, concerns. Any commissioner any comments and concerns besides the weather and the traffic? Hearing none, I'll move go on to the minutes. We have two meetings to approve the minutes for. The first one is December 3rd, regular meeting. Is there a motion to approve? Please. Can we get a motion that we can discuss it? Thank you. Is there a second? Second. And um, there's a motion and a second to approve the December 3rd regular meeting discussion. Commissioner Levinson? Just, there's a couple places where there's a reference to Senator Billing. I just need to correct the spelling of this name. And um, any further comments, concerns, changes? Hearing none, all those in favor of approval of the December 3rd regular meeting, please say aye. And opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Just for the record, I abstain from the things that didn't attend the meetings. Thank you. Get that, Janet? Next, we have the approval of December 21st special meeting. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? No, no approval. Thank you. And a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the special meeting minutes of December 21st. Any discussion or changes requested? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? <clears throat> Motion passes unanimously. Next item on our agenda is the rulemaking. Um, we have a public hearing and possible adoption of some rules. I don't have my, do I need to open the public hearing first? Okay, I, I'll open the public hearing at 9.33 and ask Lori Anderson to go over the rulemaking that we have scheduled for today. Thank you. We have four rule amendments for you to consider. Um, there has been no one that signed in to offer comment at today's hearing. We um, put the word out when we were starting to engage in rulemaking on these matters months ago and um, have not received comment on any of them. So the, there are two that deal with changes in dollar amounts, and I will start with those. The first one is WAC 390-05400, and this is the commission's annual look at adjusting contribution limits and the other dollar amounts that were enacted in Initiative 134 for um, um, inflation. And the proposed changes start on page 20 of your meeting materials. If you'd like, I can go over each of the changes. Okay. So for the um, definition of independent expenditure, the amount that qualifies something as an independent expenditure changes from $950 to $1,000. The candidate's loan reimbursement rate will change from $5,500 to $6,000. The provision that requires someone to report independent expenditures or large contributions who has no other reporting requirement with the Public Disclosure Commission 
the trigger for large contributions to statewide elections or state office elections will increase from $19,000 to $20,000 and the independent spending threshold increases from $950 to $1,000. The contribution limits amount, those that are $950 now will increase to $1,000 and those are the contribution limits for legislative candidates as well as select local office candidates. The contribution limits that are currently $1,900 increased to $2,000 and those are the limits that are applied to candidates for state executive office, judicial office, and select court districts. The limits that dictate how much money a party can give to a candidate, a bona fide party can give to a candidate, the state and caucus committee's limits will change from 95 cents per voter to one dollar per registered voter and the County and legislative district shared limit changes from 50 cents per voter. I'm sorry, it doesn't change at all. It stays at 50 cents per voter. No. Um, thank you. You're right. It was at 45 cents before. Thank you very much. Contribution limits for And the last one are the limits that can be, um, are applied to contributions, I'm sorry, I should know this like the back of my hand. Limits on contributions to political parties and caucus committees is the annual limit um, that can be given to the non-exempt funds account changes from $950 to $1,000 and those are contributions given by any to a political party or the caucus by anybody other than an individual. And this is the last change. Um, the, there's a limit on how much currency can be given in a single contribution and um, it changes from $95 to a hundred dollars. So that is the uh, painful list of all the changes that are being proposed. Would you like me to keep going through the rules uh, or would you like to vote on that amendment? I think since we have four we can just vote each one as we discuss it. Okay. So uh, if we can get a most motion and second we can discuss this. Is there a motion to approve WAC 390 05 changes in dollar amounts? We we'll move approval of the changes to WAC 390 05 400 contribution limits. Second. Thank you. There's been a motion second to approve the Changes in dollar amounts on WAC 390-05-400. Discussion on this? Yes, Grant. Just to confirm, these are just the annual inflationary changes. Every other year. Yes. And just that as we have, we have, as we have legislation pending, um, anything in that legislation that will affect these changes? Not in your own agency bill requests. There is another uh, piece of pending legislation that would be affected, and we have been in touch with committee staff who is uh, making some revisions, I believe, to incorporate uh, the changes that you're making today. I guess I would add in on that. So what that is is um, the um, 
county auditors and election officials have a bill that would allow um, the election officials to uh, not put a race on the ballot for the primary if there's only one person running. Um, you would, if there was one person running the race, you would skip the primary and be placed on the general election ballot only. That has some implications for contribution limits because right now we have a contribution limit of, if you approve this, $1,000 for the primary and $1,000 for the general election. They were trying to say in their bill that even if you're not placed on the primary ballot, you can still get the maximum contribution limit for the primary and the general. Unfortunately, they used the statutory language and so they said you can still have $1,600 as your total contribution limit when in fact that's derived from quite a few years ago when it was an $800 limit and we've uh, had the ability by rule to raise it every two years and we have. So we have been in communication with the House Council to say, you know, we don't actually use the $800 limit and have it for quite some time and it would be really helpful if you could clarify this in the bill. Uh, initially, it didn't look like it would get clarified, but we just learned yesterday that they were working on a clarification. So assuming that the clarification occurs, no problem. If the bill doesn't pass, no problem. If the bill does pass unclarified, then you could have the situation where all candidates have the current the contribution limits that we set by rule, except for those who don't have a primary election and they have a $1,600 contribution limit. It could happen, but we think it'll get cleaned up. This uh, relates also to the issue that we've put on the table about clarifying use of funds for primary and general election that came up in, I think it was the Tibet matter in the fall? Uh, Dahlquist, I think. Dahlquist, okay. Yes. I don't, we haven't um, taken any action on that, but it is something that is on the list of items that we need to do some work on internally. I don't know if that would turn into a rule or if it would in turn, you know, turn into a potential interpretation for you, but um, yes, that doesn't really implicate these contribution limits, but it is something that we're looking at is the, is the clarity on when you use the money, when it's being used for the primary election, when it's being used for the general election because of those contribution limit implications. Well, the reason I ask it is the point you just raised about races where there's going to be no primary sort of how are, how are we going to categorize those and, and make sure that what we decide on these two matters that we're integrating or thinking of. Yes, I would say if this passes and we have a change in whether a candidate has a primary election, then we will need to look at whether we need to change anything else because currently our contribution limits are tied to um, election, are tied to an election. So, you know, I was looking for the right word, but a primary and a general. Um, and if you if you skip one of those elections, then how does that play into your contribution rates? And, and clearly the intent behind this bill is to say it shouldn't, you know, just because you're skipping a primary because you're the only candidate shouldn't necessarily impair your contribution limits. Um, but we'll have to look at that. Any other discussion on this amendment? Hearing none, um, all those in favor of the changes in dollar amounts for WAC 390 05400, please say aye. Aye. And opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. The next rule for your consideration is WAC 390 016050, and that is the form for contributions and expenditures that an out-of-state political committee uses if they meet the criteria set out for out-of-state committee special reporting. When they do qualify and are able to use that out-of-state committee report, they disclose large contributions from that uh, they have received from anywhere, um, not just inside of Washington State, that um, at a certain threshold. The commission has a statutory requirement to do an annual adjustment for inflation for that threshold, and the proposal would change the threshold from the current $2,645 to $2,680. 
and staff asks you to amend and uh, approve the amendment, please. Thank you. Is there a motion for WAC 390 I thought you said 16, this is 15. 390 16 050. Thank you. 390-16-050 changes. Is there a motion, please? I still move. Thank you. And a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the changes to forms for contributions and expenditures of out of state political committees in. WAC 390-16-050. Any comments or concerns from the council? Just the, the same uh, one, Gloria, in terms of our legislation pending about trying to you know, eliminate differences between in-state and out-of-state obligations. Yes, you um, do have a bill working its way through the Senate right now that would eliminate a special report for out-of-state committees and bring them in alignment with in-state committees for disclosure purposes. And I should add that same bill is also part of the omnibus, omnibus package we have at the House. So you have in both chambers the plan to change this in the future um, so that both out-of-state and in-state political committees would follow the same rules. But today, they don't, and today we also have an obligation to um, to look at this. Is it every year, every two years, every year, every year? So, even if you don't like it, you still have to look at it. But we may have to come back. If the legislation were to pass, we, we would repeal we have to come back this rule. Yeah. Yes, we would have had a repealer at that whenever for whenever that statutory amendment takes effect. else? Hearing none, all those in favor of the changes to WAC 390-16-050, please say aye. Aye. And opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. The next rule for your consideration is WAC 390-12-200, Public Disclosure Commission, Executive Director. And this rule um, started out before you for amendment when uh, the alternatives for resolving complaints were first um, before you and we were inserting the authority for the uh, executive director to authorize one of those alternative responses to resolve a complaint and um, the commission asked the staff to update the rule to make it more clear exactly what the duties of the executive director are. So um, we're asking you to approve this amendment as well. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve? Madam Chair, I move adoption for approval of the post rule 390-12-200. And a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve WAC 390-12-200 Public Disclosure Commission Executive Director changes. For the discussion on this amendment or change. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I was looking at sub seven. I don't recall us having a discussion about the delegating authority to subordinates. Um, that's pretty broad sweeping in terms of any authority. It's up to you. But yes, current <laughs> the proposal would give them any authority. So my question really focuses on it's a practical matter, contracting authority is what I was thinking. Uh, do we have any internal policies or procedures about doing that? And we do. We have limits on the amount that people other than the executive director can contract for having the official signature of the executive director. Do you know what those, I don't know what those limits are. I, um, I you know, the only big contract that we've had is the contract with Portland Web Works for the web design. 
and that went through the state's, um, you know, CIO office or something like that, I think. So it went to a, a more centralized computer authorization process. I'm not necessarily contracting authority. I know we have an office policy about use of our agency purchase card, which is kind of like a credit card. And the people who are authorized to sign and use that card are spelled out in the policy and their authority is included there as well, their spending authority. So just to follow up on a question, does the agency have a delegation of authority protocol in place? So they're approved by the commission? There is a delegation of authority protocol in place, but I believe it is on our list of um, items that need to be updated because it is under the last executive director. So my, my suggestion, if others are comfortable with it, would be to, to amend this language to say uh, delegation consistent with the agency protocols as adopted by the commission so that then we would look at those protocols and set whatever limits we think appropriate. And we wouldn't have to keep coming back and changing this rule. But also my other concern in addition to the one Grant raised is the um, you know, we've now delegated authority for brief adjudicative matters and other things in order to streamline processes. So we want to be careful about whether that authority is redelegated in some way that would not be consistent with the commission's intent. So you haven't actually delegated the authority for brief adjudicative matters because the commission is not, by statute, the commission cannot delegate its authority to find a violation. So, um, the alternative responses are in lieu of going forward with an enforcement when it's just a minor technical violation. Said, thank you. Appreciate it. So for those reasons, I think it would be helpful if we could review the protocol. Yeah. What's the, what's it called? Um, the delegation of authority. I, I believe is it, it's, uh, it's in a folder that I have on my desk, and I believe it's an agency um, delegation of authority. And it, it is important. We have to have that, um, you know, in case of emergencies and things like that, to know who, who can be in charge. Um, so, it, you know, it's on the list. Jan has been updating our policies, and we will do that. But we could definitely bring that back by next time. And could we also then add that to our annual master calendar that maybe once a year we would look at that protocol to see if any adjustments were needed? That's a good idea, and January is a good time to do that because that's also um, the month where we do um, all of the staff fill out their conflict of interest forms. So that seems a, a logical time to do that. So we're back to um, item seven on this uh, change. You had some generalized changes. I believe um, the revision that the commission wants is at the, um, we'll tack on at the end of number seven, consistent with agency protocols as adopted by commission, by the commission. The, I would say consistent with the agency delegation of authority protocol as adopted by the commission. We have a discrete name for it, it's a document, it's, it's a continuity of operations plan. Whatever it's called, that we're consistent over time and that that's the legally binding. Yes. Mechanism. So, or could you just re restate what you wrote down there because it'll be helpful for us. So, uh, the number seven will read: the executive director may delegate authority to subordinates to act for him or her as needed and appropriate, consistent with the agency delegation of authority protocols as adopted by commission. The commission. Um, and we may do a little tweaking of the actual name of the document. Yes, please. I would, I, would, I would move that we amend sub seven to read as just recited by staff. Second that. Any further discussion on the amendment to the change? Hearing none, all those in favor of the amendment? Aye. And opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Any further discussion on this item? Then I would ask for a vote on the changes to Public Disclosure Commission Executive Director, WAC 390-12-200. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. And opposed, motion passes unanimously as amended. Thank you. 
Next, and the last one, yay, SWAC 390 400 time limit to solicit or accept contributions. And this amendment rolls into the existing rule, the commission's interpretation about session freeze and the ability of candidate or um, elected officials who are subject to the session freeze to participate in fundraising um, events held by other candidates and using um, those officials who will be attending the events names in the fundraising advertisements as well as the state officials ability to participate in caucus events and the um, requirements that the caucuses will have to segregate the money raised at those events and use them for um, things that are outside of the freeze limitations. So if you, um, let's, Commissioner Degenger, it looks like you have some questions maybe. Yeah, I, I just, I found it difficult to parse. Could you just kind of walk through it? Sure. So this starts on page 33 of your materials and the, the first change where um, subsection six is struck is, is reinserted later. And um, on page, on the second page of the, the rule, I'm not sure exactly what page it is in your material, at the very top is the first section that's lifted pretty much verbatim from the interpretation inserted in this rule, which says that a, a state official who is subject to the freeze may attend a fundraiser for another candidate who is not subject to the freeze, provided that the state official does not solicit or accept any contributions in connection with the fundraiser. So number one, they can just go. So let's give an example of that. Suppose Patty Murray was having a fundraiser in Seattle and wanted Governor Jay Inslee to attend. He is unable to fundraise right now because of the session freeze. Uh, this would indicate that he could attend that as long as he wasn't doing any fundraising for his own campaign. Am I right? Yes. And that he is not there actually getting up during the fundraiser and saying, please give contributions to Patty Murray. Okay, so he can well, attend, but he can't mm -hmm. fundraise even for someone else? Correct. Okay. Smile and shake hands. can smile yeah, and shake hands. Eat, eat lunch. Uh, and the second um, part is that his attendance could be mentioned in the advertisements for that event. So sometimes they'll use names as draws to get other people to come to their fundraising events. So could he go and have pictures taken with him for $25 a piece? What's the $25 going to be used for? Go to the campaign? No. Not if it goes to his campaign. Could he no. or her campaign? For her campaign, any campaign. Any if campaign. went to some generic thing, could? Uh, they could be doing charitable work during the session freeze. I'm not sure that happens at fundraising events. But could it? Could the money go to a PAC? No. So the um, the person who is subject to the freeze in this scenario, Governor Inslee, he cannot be fundraising for anybody, himself, another political committee, the parties. Um, so they cannot tie any money to him being there, basically. Correct. They can just show up to yeah. maybe encourage other people to come. To be a draw. But they could say in their advertisement, Governor Jay Inslee will be there. Mm -hmm. Come meet Governor Jay Inslee. So, I'm not quite sure I understand the distinction between those. If the purpose of putting another elected official's name in your materials is so that more people come to your event so that you can raise more money, how is that not using that elected, how, how is that distinguishable between the candidate shaking hands and 
taking a photo and charging twenty-five dollars. Back when this interpretation was adopted, the um, commissioner commission heard from individuals who said just because my name is going on that flyer doesn't mean that I am actually doing any soliciting for that individual. Um, and that's where, where we are today. Well, and if I could um, give a possible reason why this is a good idea. Uh, um, we don't want to, as the regulators, be forced into a position where we're looking all the time at trying to discern, trying to discern the intent behind something. So the difficulty with with your question, which is a very good question, which is what is the difference between, um, you know, flagging that you have a high level um, state candidate at your event, we'll presume you're doing that to get more people there. But maybe you're doing that because you just want to show that there's broad support across the state or, or interest in the topic you're discussing. And so the difficulty is if we said you can't do that, if it's for the purpose of getting people there, we would we could potentially be in the um, unfortunate position of getting into arguments over why were you there? Were you there to get people there? No, no, no. We weren't. We didn't ask him to increase the number of attendants. We just, you know, thought it was a courtesy to have the governor there, or you know, we were going to discuss some environmental issues and wanted to have him there, or he, we wanted to give him the opportunity to make a speech on something that was important to him, and then it, that's very difficult to regulate. So um, this would be a little bit more simple. But these are all in the context of fundraisers. Yes. Now some fundraisers have a mixed purpose. I know if you if you've ever been to the, which I will not be going to in the future, um, you know the Patty Mary Golden Tennis Shoe Award yeah, thing. Exactly. But maybe in your past life you've seen things like that. Um, you've heard of such things. We so <laughs> understand they occur. Um, you know it it's pretty much a fundraiser. But then they also are, are honoring people from local communities and things like that. And I also think back in the day when the interpretation was adopted that um, the commission was maybe thinking, so this activity is all done by a candidate who is not subject to the freeze. And the, the dignitary who is going and subject to the freeze doesn't necessarily know that their name is being used, so we don't. They didn't want to get into the gotcha situation. Sort of like the photocopy issue we were looking at earlier. Well, and the photocopy is one of our pieces of request legislation, where if you're a candidate and somebody goes to your website, snips your picture, and uses it for some fundraising, you're not going to be charged with an in-kind uh, contribution unless you coordinated or cooperated with that. So the gotcha piece is very significant. The reason I wanted to call this out of it was anybody just reading this, you know we try to be precise, doesn't understand what we're trying to accomplish. And I think it's important. Uh, we've, we've, we've talked about the unintended consequences of certain regulations, whether it's on the amount of time we spent discussing how to exempt uh, very broad invitations to event, uh, events uh, where food is served, and now that's become uh, <laughs> legendary. <laughs> and so, if we can make it clear, and the, the idea is not in, 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 is that the, the purpose of the statute is to make it clear that if you're not fundraising, you can attend, but but you can't fundraise. And that's what we're saying. Yes. And then the third piece is that complimentary admission can be given by the candidate who is doing the fundraiser to the state official that they're trying to get to go to their fundraiser. Then um, the, the other changes that appear later are um, just where we moved the earlier section about caucus committee fundraising that was struck from the first um, page of the rule amendment we just moved it to try to this is a very long um, the commission has one rule about session freeze and it's very long and a little unwieldy and so we were by moving this particular section about the caucus fundraising we're just trying to make it flow a little bit better it's not really it's not 
the change so much as a revision to the um, structure. Yeah, and one thing we could do um, for the future, and I don't want to um, dissuade you from approving this because I think we need this in place for all of the exciting activities coming up in 2016. But, you know, we could look at breaking this down in the future. And we could look at uh, providing some examples in the rule. You know, some rules will have examples. So if you, and again, I'm saying, I'm not trying to derail this because I think this is a good process for right now and we'll get us where we need to be. But if you would like us to look at, you know, breaking it down and giving some examples, we can work on that. Um, we'll be doing another look at rules um, in June. Or you, you do have the interpretation, you do have this rule as it is. If you want us to break it down a little bit more, now we can do that. Yeah, we, That's one of the benefits of the interpretations versus the rules, which I think we may be talking a little bit as we go along. Uh, interpretations, we can uh, be a lot more nimble and uh, change them, create them, get rid of them, alter them at any commission meeting with appropriate notice, whereas the rules process is more cumbersome. And the interpretation has been in effect for quite some time. It's become a standard practice. Um, it's fully embedded. I think it's very stable at this point. Having it continue in existence through the 2016 session, I don't think would be a bad thing if you want us to do a little more work on the rules. Is there any change anticipated in the landscape? Is anybody legislatively looking at freeze? Is there any reason to not put this in place for 2016? Can we, and this part of what we're going to talk about in terms of interpretations versus rules, right? Have you heard of anything, Lori? I have not. No, I haven't seen anything at all on, on session freeze. I'm lost. We have a motion or a second on this. We don't. We're just discussing this. Oh. Chair lets you have control. Yeah. That's because it was a question. Yeah. Uh, That's right. Grant started. Yeah. The discussion is not. We go again. Yeah. So, yeah, I, my, my thinking is uh, it would be important to have clarity in this time. Look at providing some examples of other things, which may be useful. Because who knows? It would be crazy enough to sit and listen to this <laughs> telecast. But um, at least we have some discussion from which that can be uh, and uh, better understood. So that was my objective in the conversation. Was so we made it. A little bit clearer what we're, we're what we're intending to do here, uh, and that we are uh, trying to provide some things. So I'd move approval of the revisions to WAC. Are we adopting it or is it revising it? Revising it. Revising three ninety seventeen four hundred. Is there a second? been moved and seconded to um, adopt the revisions to WAC 390-17-400, time limit to solicit or accept contributions. Any further discussion or concerns on this? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. And opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Just a quick question. You get it noted on the agenda that we've got the wrong rule number, the wrong WAC number. Do we actually, do we need to Normally, vote to amend the agenda to make a correction like that, or just the I think that to be, I'm not sure if it's required, but to be absolutely on the safe side, since you've asked, I think uh, a motion to amend the agenda to change that rule number would be appropriate. Excuse me, which one is wrong? The second one down, WAC 390-16-05, 
Rose says dash 15. Oh, just on the agenda? Oh, on the agenda. On the actual public facing. Yeah, so on the agenda under the 9.35 a.m. rulemaking, under the public hearing and possible adoption, um, the second bullet says WAC 390-15050. And the correct would be, uh, what is the correct number? 390-16050. So a motion to amend the agenda to reflect that would be appropriate. I move that the commission amend the agenda with respect to uh, the second item on the agenda rulemaking. And the second item on the rulemaking, which is uh, as stated in the agenda, WAC 390 15 050 to WAC 390 16 050. Is there a second? Been moved and seconded to um, adopt a change to the agenda on WAC 390 15 050 to WAC 390 16 050. Further discussion? Very none. All those in favor? Aye. And opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. And I believe I turned in those numbers. Thank you. So if there's any concerns from the public that they didn't get proper notice on this change, let us know when we will redo it all. Next time is the preliminary discussion for conversion <coughs> to rules, interpretations. Thank you. So that um, last session for his interpretation was the 10th interpretation that the Commission has converted to rule over the last um, 18 months or so. And this was um, converting the rules was an initiative that Andrea Doyle got underway when she became the executive director. And I had just identified the ones that I believe were um, ready to convert. And they were the 10 that he just finished up. There was another package of six more that related to public facilities and their election activities that a lot of uh, stakeholder work had gone into developing those guidelines um, and all of the six interpretations. And I thought that they may be ready to convert, they may be stable at this point, um, but I did not want to go forward with that without going back to all the stakeholders that had participated when the interpretations were drafted. So um, we did that in December. We approached many, many, many groups, somewhere between 25 and 30, and asked for their comments. We didn't get many comments. Those that came in were all in favor of leaving the interpretations as they are. Those comments have been provided to you and so at that this time the staff is has um re is recommending to you that those interpretation those six interpretations not be converted. Questions or concerns? All right, this is more of an update and you can tell us your preference. No question no. So the folks that raised the issues about the value, value of interpretations, staying as interpretations, mm -hmm. were uh, seemed to me to be directed toward the school district interpretation. I didn't see comments related to the judicial robes or the buttons. But the Seattle Olympics and elections made a comment about the buttons, but not in terms of interpretation versus rule. Right. Um, or the and they also made a comment regarding libraries, but not interpretation versus rule. So, so we have um, two different sets of guidelines. We started with one that was for to cover all local governments, and at the time that was adopted, the school districts came back after a little bit of time and said, you know, we have um, other powers about or surrounding elections and urging people to vote and registering people to vote. 
that not all local agencies have. And so we think we need our own guidelines. So that um, we went forward with that proposal and we wound up with two sets of guidelines. And then the other um, four interpretations involving libraries and buttons and judges robes and the definition of what's an open press conference. Um, I think they could actually all be rolled into those guidelines so that there's one stop shopping, if you will, for the local agencies and then the school districts. So you, I'm sorry, you see these all as part and parcel of the same subject area? I do. And then we were talking, when we talked about this a few months ago, we were talking about the pros and cons of rules versus interpretations. And one of the objectives for me in looking at whether more should be converted to rule was uh, making it easier for folks who want to comply. And that when we have uh, laws and rules and interpretations, it so can be cumbersome or challenging to know where to look and what, on what to rely. And some of the feedback we've gotten from folks was that because on the website you can't search by subject matter or by question and say, I have a question about judicial robes, or I have, that you'd have to know whether something was in WAC or interpretation. So part of the objective was to uh, simplify it for the regulated community. And if we leave these as interpretations, do you have some thoughts about how we might accomplish that goal? I do. In designing our new website that we're going to talk about a little bit later, today, we are elevating the presence of interpretation so that they're not buried under a couple different layers. And there will be the ability to do a comprehensive search on the new website that is not there today, where you can type in judge's robe and get, and you would get a response pointing you to the interpretation. So you wouldn't have to know, for example, that something is, and what interpretation even is, it's not a commonly used word to mean what we're talking about. You would not. I would say in terms of sort of administrative procedure, it is not uncommon for um, regulatory and quasi-judicial agencies to have some um, interpretations or significant decisions and uh, in addition to rules. And that's because um, there are areas that either don't fit very cleanly into a rule or that um, the administrative agency wants to give a bit of a more nuanced explanation for this is how we look at this sort of thing or when we see this sort of problems, the priorities that we are concerned with are A, B, and C. Um, so those kind of qualitative decisions uh, and discussions fit better into um, either administrative guidelines or, in our case, uh, commission interpretations rather than rules, which really need to be much more do this, do not do that, um, to be clear. Um, so there is a role for the um, administrative guideline or interpretation. I think that the important part is first to regularly review, you know, is it still a good interpretation? Does it still reflect what we think? Second, is it, has it become so routine that it really should move into rule, as you've discussed? And, um, you know, and finally, you know, do people know what this is and can they find it? And it's an interesting, it's been a very interesting task in looking at the website and trying to think about what the website's purpose is. Because most people who, are, who might come to the website and look for what it says about judicial robes are probably not just members of the public. They're probably people who have some reason to be interested in what the rules are regarding judicial robes. So um, with our website, I think we can make some assumptions that for things like interpretations, it's going to be more likely our regulated community looking for that. And they just need to know where things are and, and, and how to make use of it, as opposed to the general public, which may or may not know what an interpretation is. The other, the other factor I would add to our analysis is whether the landscape is changing. So we might not want to adopt a rule if things are fluid, ex, you know, external factors are fluid. Um, we have talked about, again, putting on the master calendar a regular review of interpretations once or twice a year to make sure 
so, so that also as people look at something and it says adopted as interpretation in 1992, um, there's something, maybe we put a marker on each one that says last reviewed for possible conversion to rule in 2014. So at least it shows there's an intention of thought. It's not just it was left there and hasn't been addressed. Mm -hmm. And that there was considerable, there was consideration into whether it should be one or the other. We did put on our on our master calendar that we'll review rules in January and June at the same time that we look at the six month rulemaking calendar. It seemed to be a good place for that to occur. Interpretations. The interpretations. Yeah, and I think, um, yeah, we could definitely do a you know reviewed on such and such a date too on that. The other area where I think an interpretation works very well is if um, the commission is looking at um, at doing at, ju at doing anything where you're not absolutely certain what it, you know what the outcome is going to be. It's, it's sort of a good uh, test lab for you know this is our interpretation. Let's put it out there. Let's see what happens. What kind of response we get back? Um, because as I said, it's a much more uh, flexible process then then once something is in rule. Last question. So in as I haven't looked at the this section of the website, but at least do we have language in there that explains to users what interpretations are and, and what so can you say if you're looking, you know, when you say take me to judicial robes or something, it takes you to interpretations, it's something there that says PDC interpretations are thus and such, right? And that as distinguished from rules or laws. So, again, just to try to have people looking at that web page, I believe, right now. Just to make it. I don't remember off the top of my head. It's part of our philosophy of trying mm -hmm. to get rid of all the lingo and challenges to you know, just make things as user friendly as possible. Mm -hmm. so if we don't, I would just suggest that we do. We can do that if it's not there. That's, we did that today. Change so, Ms. Sanders, in the summary of your, your comments, or that we don't change these interpretations into rules, at least right now. Right? Correct. And that you will try to combine as many of these interpretations as you can into one interpretation. Some probably are standalone, but uh, they may be not. Well, they all deal with the same subject, which is public agencies and their election activities. So for that reason, and considering that the guidelines that are currently in place are kind of a chart or a roadmap that address different groups and their activities and activities um, separate from, as separate sections and um, like buildings have their own section. So the way they're laid out, I think we can put as much in there as we want, keeping in mind that it's all laid out by categories. And I just think if I was coming to an agency and wanted to know um, something about a particular subject, I would rather have it all laid out in front of me rather than in five or six different pieces. I think related to that is as you're refining the search capability and the clarity on the website, you want to make sure that people can get there either way. So if you put in public facilities use, it would take you there. If you put in judicial ropes, it would yes. take you. So do you have the direction you need from the commission here? So, um, I'm, we're asking if you agree with that these should be left as interpretations now, all six. And um, if so, then do you want to work on consolidating them? Um, sure. So the ethics, Seattle Ethics and Elections comments actually encouraged us to look at the substance, I believe, of the political buttons interpretation and the library interpretation express some not concern about whether it's interpretation or rule but actually what the interpretation was right. you know, they disagree the rights they disagree so um, a, a question that 
proposes for us is whether we actually want to have substantive review of those interpretations or whether you feel like you've had sufficient input or I don't know the history of the, the stakeholder involvement in those interpretations and whether based on the Ethics and Elections Commission input we need to put it out for comment again. So maybe you could help us understand that. Yeah. Well, those are very, the library interpretation is very old, and I'm not sure what sort of stakeholder work went into creating it. I do know that the libraries <coughs> are very appreciative of it, and I get at least one comment every year from a library who calls and asks about whether or not they can allow campaigns to come in and post information and I point them to the interpretation and they are very appreciative that the, for the guidance that's there. They also, most um, library staff, I believe, think that they have a, a duty to inform the public and just be um, kind of an information hub. And so um, if there are local made ballot measures that I think they, they see themselves as a natural place where people would want to come and find information about anything, including um, ballot measures or perhaps other campaigns. Um, as far as the buttons, I think that was um, adopted because of case law about the freedom of expression. Um, agencies, as far as the buttons, agencies can adopt their own policies that are much stricter and enforce them. They don't have to follow the commission's interpretation. I know some, like the uh, city of Vancouver, for example, does not allow people to, employees to wear buttons or camp, campaign related clothing. I think the ethics and election input uh, the commission input was on the library's one that he felt it implied they had an obligation, affirmative obligation, to ensure there was opposing candidate or committee materials provided. So if, if ballot measure A comes in and drops some stuff off at the library that, that we were suggesting, or the PC was suggesting, that somehow the library had an affirmative obligation to make sure the alternative position. That, um, that's not the interpretation that they, um, if they do allow, then it needs to be done on an equal access basis. Allowing it on mm -hmm. no affirmative obligation. Right. Correct. So I think the question is, um, does the commission want any work done to vet out any issues on or are they okay with them as they are? And then number two, do you want to leave them as interpretations or move them to rules? So John, what, what are your thoughts down there? Well, um, I think my thoughts are these, that we, in reverse order, that we leave them as interpretations rather than rules. Uh, that we keep the same interpretations, but that Ms. Anderson, if she can, try to kind of combine some of these, mm -hmm. if that makes sense to her, to, you know, to, you know, what ones to combine and what ones not to. It, it does, and um, the one of the comments received addressed um, an subject social media that isn't covered in the interpret the guidelines for school districts and we do get quite a few questions about that so i think that's the next natural thing to work on as far as updating those school district and local government guidelines and a, a, i would suggest at that time that um, we also look at consolidating as much as possible the other piece that I don't know if Commissioner Bridges was going to get to it was if there is a way of making it easier to navigate to the interpretations on the website, mm -hmm. that would be 
kind of photo as well. <clears throat> and you mentioned that we'll be talking about that later. So I guess I'll save a placeholder for it. Yes. understand a little bit more on the distinction between, we've used the terms guidelines, interpretations, and next on the agenda is policy. <laughs> so, um, dare I ask, um, is there clarity about what those each are and how what the interplay is? Or, sure. Am I going down a rabbit hole here? No. No. Um, so, interpretive statements are actually addressed in the Administrative Procedures Act, and when you adopt one or make changes, we file something with the code revisor, flagging that for the public. It goes into the state register. And um, we call them guidelines for these different bodies, but they are actually adopted as interpretations. So when the guidelines are interpretations. Later in the meeting we're going to be talking about this policy that's been out there that was guidance that was adopted by the Commission many years ago in the early 90s. Why it was adopted as a policy none of the current staff know. It should have been an interpretation. It feels like an interpretation. Um, they, The Commission had been making adopting interpretations at that point when they adopted that policy. But I'm not sure why they pigeonholed it in this other category. It's all guidance or that how the commission would interpret a particular statute and the company rules. But it's not filed with the code revision? I don't believe it was. Is that the only one of those we have? Yes, one of the stray children. So if we do this uh, language to clarify for the public or users regularly what uh, uh, interpretations are, perhaps in that description we can say sometimes referred to as guidelines and make it so that when they're searching, if they put in guidelines or interpretations, mm -hmm. since, since we've kind of used them interchangeably. And I think the reason, so all interpretations get a name, number one, and the name for those two just include the word guidelines. And I think the reason why was just because of how they're structured into the different categories of activities and by um, individuals and that it was kind of a map to the different guidelines for those activities and individuals. And am I right in following up on that? If we were to develop a new interpretation on use of social media and use that as an opportunity to also try to pull all of our various pieces of use of facilities into one uh, larger interpretation that has very clear subsections for each area, would you also like us to look at this singular policy and uh, propose, uh, review that, propose turning it into an interpretation also either part of this interpretation or a separate interpretation so that we don't have this third outlying category of, of policies with just one item in it. I thought that's where this was heading, so. But not yeah. right. And that is the next agenda item. Mm -hmm. So the commission is pretty much Consensus over taking a look at combining the interpretations that you feel are necessary when you look at the social media and then not turning anything into a rule at this time. Correct? Any dis? So why don't we move on to applying uh, limits to contributions made to affiliate commissions? Okay, so we've kind of teed it up already. Um, that's an additional piece of guidance that's out there about how the commission interprets, um, how the commission applies contribution limits to the contributor who is giving to 
um, political committees that are controlled by the same individual who is subject to contribution limits. So, for example, I am a candidate, I have my campaign over here for state legislature, and I also control a second committee um, that I have formed, and I am um, the, the single person in charge of that committee, or I am one of two people. If I'm one of three, I don't control that committee. If I'm one of two or fewer, I control that committee. And if someone comes, if you come along and want to contribute to me as a candidate or my committee or both, you, the contributor, have a contribution limit that's going to be $2,000 pretty soon. So you can spread that $2,000 among my two committees or give it. Uh, the whole amount to one or the other. You cannot give $2,000 to my campaign committee and another $2,000 or any amount to my um, other committee. So as we noted, it's in this thing called a policy. It's the only policy like that that interprets statutes. Um, and it also needs if the commission wants to continue having that as their, I'm going to say interpretation for lack of a better word, or a policy, it needs to be updated because it only addresses um, certain candidates who have contribution limits and limits have been expanded over the years. It does not incorporate the um, decision about ballot measure committees not having limits. So, um, our question was, do you think it's still a good policy, number one? And number two, uh, if you do, then it needs to be updated, and would you rather it be an interpretation or a rule? And I can tell you, this is probably the third time we have brought this to the commission. The first time was right after the um, public disclosure law got recodified. And we were looking through everything in the office that needed to be revised. And at the time, the general counsel said, let's turn that policy into an interpretation. We drafted it. We brought it to the commission. They suggested changes. And by the time um, the next <laughs> meeting rolled around, there was litigation that um, caused the general counsel to put the brakes on that um, interpretation drafting. So then um, we tried again a few years ago, and that was a, a case that kind of put the brakes on it again at that time. So now I think it's, the road is open. We can move forward. And the question is, how do you want to move forward? Suggestions? Do you have a recommendation? Well, you've been trying to get um, lessen the amount of interpretations you have. And so for that reason, because as I said, we started drafting an interpretation quite a number of years ago. And I thought about just bringing that to you. And then I thought, why create another interpretation that some down, time down the road you might want to convert? And it makes more sense to me just to go forward with rulemaking. With that, I'd like to put it on our 2016 rule. Okay. So, did, would that cause us to need to repeal this policy and make it a rule, or by making it a rule, it just negates this policy? The policy just goes away. It's also a much more public process, and you can um, make sure that we get everyone involved that wants to be involved. And for me, that's a substitute. I think there's a lot to be discussed in here. I think we're making will get more attention by stakeholders. Yeah, I agree with that because you know, some of the language in here is bona fide political committee as opposed to a non bona fide. I mean, there's just descriptions here that that are uh, difficult to understand in a functional way. And then I guess the other part of it is <clears throat> if we have provisions in here that have become suspect due to recent court decisions. 
then you could probably you know, fix that. It sounds like we do. So we've got a policy that's not compliant and probably not a good policy to have a policy that's not compliant. It's probably need to do something. I could add to that, I think also the discussion about whether we should have other indicia of control is a little bit um, narrow to suggest that if, if it's just one person or two. So if you have the same treasure, the same PO box, the same this, the same, is that a direction we want to go in to say that's, that's a vehicle for dark money or for some other lack of compliance? And I, and I don't, I don't it's sufficient time to think it through, but just reading this for this meeting occurred to me that perhaps we need to broaden that. You know, and I would add in on that, one of the difficulties with our rules, I think, where we're regulating contribution limits is that, you know, you just set a new challenge for someone to figure out a way around it. And so, yes, if you say, you know, you can, you. If you're one of three people, you're not considered to be controlling. You know, we all know that individuals may be the controlling personality or the controlling interest in a three or four person group. At the same time, you, you've got to come up with something that's clear enough to regulate. So, you know, it, it, it certainly would be nice if the rulemaking process helps us to vet that out and think about it. But, you know, I guess I would add in this is kind of an, an odd comment, but always consider whether something is unregulatable. Too. You know, if it's unregulatable, then we probably shouldn't be putting a rule out there so that only the um, only the compliant people are paying attention to and the non compliant people are ignoring. But yeah, but we could all, you know, vet that through the rulemaking process. I think, it, it, good, I agree with that, but I think even thinking through that control issue, right, is if there are four of you, but they're all family members or mm -hmm. they all work for the same, you're the employer. I mean, they're just different. Just, just a numerical evaluation isn't really going to get us to another issue. There's been enough development in the case law since this was adopted that I think uh, through the rulemaking process we can probably craft something that will make sense. So it's always hard Um, do we ever ask whether we need to craft a new rule in place of the policy? As opposed to being silent? Yes. Just get rid of the policy. That should be part of the discussion in the rulemaking. That the parties should come in and say, you don't need a rule and this isn't, you're trying to regulate something that doesn't actually even need to be regulated. And um, so that that should always be a consideration. Okay. In the meantime, does the policy remain in effect? Have we been even applying it, Lori? Yes. And it's mostly in the case of uh, candidates who are subject to limits. There's a few county council members and a few legislators who have formed political committees. And they form those committees so that they can make contributions primarily to other candidates. Um, and so we keep them apprised of the policy um, so that they are not. Another piece of that is as a candidate, you can only have one authorized committee for your own campaign. And we wouldn't want some candidate out there having their own authorized campaign committee plus another political committee that is receiving all kinds of money that they're going to then dump into their own campaign um, or others' campaigns. I would agree that if this is the only policy item we have, that we need to get rid of the policy tied <coughs> into it and to put it into either interpretation rules. And I can't do it personally. So we 
you have enough direction? I do. Thank you very much. Review January to June rules development agenda. Are you doing that also, Lori? So that is on page 49 of your meeting materials. Each um, six months, the commission has to develop a, an agenda that is uh, filed in the state register so that the public has an idea of what rulemaking is coming up. And we, the staff reviews what should go on that agenda, and then we bring our list to you, and you simply give us a thumbs up or thumbs down. And so we have a lot of rulemaking underway. Um, that will go on the agenda just because it's not done yet, the hearings that happened today, as well as the expedited rulemaking to update our forms with our website address and eliminating the signature requirement for the electronic filing accounts. Um, that will go on the agenda. The converting that policy will also go on the agenda that you just discussed. And, um, a placeholder for 2016 legislation. Any new legislation that comes out that needs clarification will um, do that during the six month period, hopefully. Other than that, we did not identify any other rulemaking that we thought was necessary right now. Yeah. I would just like to suggest that we. Uh, Hold off until we finish our retreat today, strategic planning work. Oh, sure. And then, if anything, we find timely to move forward, we can. Okay. Keep it so, does this need to be approved today? Or is this something that we need to vote on? Or is this something that. No, you don't need to vote on it. Just keep, we're keeping you informed, making sure that you agree with the staff. And what I've heard is. Um, that this looks good for now and and to add anything that comes out of the retreat today. Anything else? If not, we'll look to the staff reports. Starting with the executive director. Okay, and I will start with mine and try to be pretty prompt because I think you're going to want to spend more time looking at IT since we've got a, a mock up of the website to walk you through. Um, this has been a busy month. This is my first legislative session where I actually engage with legislators. It has been very interesting. I've testified uh, on Representative Moeller's bill regarding uh, electronic filing of lobbyist reports in the House, um, on Senator Billig's introduction of our request legislation for uh, making out-of-state committees follow the same rules as in-state committees in the Senate. Um, and so the House, and uh, these matters are before the um, House State Government Committee, which is chaired by Representative Sam Hunt in the Senate. Our matters go to the Government Operations and Security Committee, chaired by Senator Pam Roach. Um, and uh, uh, also, very nice um, so turn of events, um, Representative Sam Hunt agreed to sponsor all of our um, request legislation in the House, and then he rolled it all into an omnibus bill. So we have an omnibus, omnibus bill 2697, and that has been heard in the um, State Government Committee and is moved into the Rules Committee. Everything, well, the Senate matter doesn't seem to have moved, uh, but that may be okay. But the House items have moved into rules. Uh, we also made a presentation last Friday at the uh, General Government and Information Technology Committee. They wanted to have a commission day, so they invited a number of small commissions to come and talk about um, what we do, um, what our budget issues are, what our challenges are, um, and that was very well received. Um, I've been continuing to meet with individual lawmakers. I've met with um, Senator Habib. Um, met with Senator McCoy last night and Representative Hawkins. I have a meeting with um, the new representative, uh, Noel Frame, next week. And um, we received a request for me to come meet with uh, Senator Ranker uh, tomorrow. So now it's at 8.45 tomorrow meeting. That 
will be interesting. He is on the Senate Ways and Means Committee and uh, has questions um, about our budget and about advertising. I suspect that this may be further um, discussion of the monies that we used last year for some get out the vote advertising. We partnered with King County to um, have a couple of public service announcements run um, prior to elections that um, featuring people like Rick Steves and um, Clint Dempsey from the Sounders, uh, urging people to find out information about campaigns and candidates by going to the PDC website and becoming an informed voter. Um, a constituent contacted uh, Senator Andy Hill about that, and he contacted us with some concerns that we had spent that money on uh, advertising. And I think that those questions are continuing. So we'll handle those tomorrow morning. But that's about it. I uh, taped a 10-minute um, video on the Public Disclosure Commission for the Washington Coalition for Open Government, and they have that now on their website. They're trying to get open government entities to provide short explanations about what the mission is and what we do. I also attended their conference on Saturday. Um, that has been so far very valuable in making some good contacts. Uh, especially with people who might have questions about our legislative agenda. So it's been busy, um, much busier than I had anticipated, and I have fallen behind on my reports to you, but I hope to catch up with that tomorrow. Any questions on Yes, yeah, so meetings? is this 10 minute video on our website? Oh, well, very good question. No, it's not, but we could probably get it on our website. I'm sure we can get it on our website. I don't know, website. we have to talk to the right oh, people. <laughs> I'm sure we can. It's you know it's it's actually completely horrifying to watch yourself talk on video, and once you get past the double chin issue and everything else, <laughs> then you can think, oh, I actually sound okay. Just it's James, just horrifying. Thanks. <laughs> Put a mustache over something. Yeah. So we'll we'll see. We'll see. I'm sure they. I'm sure we can get a copy of that. It was very interesting doing that. Um, any other? Updates on the process improvements still ongoing, and what's our schedule? Here? Yes and no. Uh, we have been meeting regularly, um, mostly with the enforcement team on process improvements. Moved very efficiently through um, everyone getting up to date on using the Fresh Desk application to put all new complaints in, so that we've got one place that everyone can see where all of the matters are. Um, and um, we bogged down a little bit when we were moving more into developing the investigative plan. Um, so we're taking a bit of a hiatus right now while the investigative team uh, and I work on some aspects of what an investigative plan looks like and how it needs to work for us. And then we will restart, um, you know, once we've sorted out some of those issues with the team. I was saying, James, can you give any other information on the process improvements. I haven't been participating in the process improvements for, you know, IT or for uh, customer service. Yeah, so that's been um, an ongoing process for the customer service folks. Um, for IT, we don't really have processes that fall in line with typical lean process analysis, and rather we're using Agile and specifically Scrum, which is a methodology that's used in the software development world pretty widely, but it has similar principles. Um, it's actually a little more structured, and so we operate in two-week chunks. Um, at the end of each one of those, we do a retrospective about what works, what doesn't work, what's the plan for the next two weeks, get through the plan, evaluate the plan, and continue going through that cycle. So it's got some analogs, um, but it's applied a little differently. And Lori, what about customer service and their process improvements? Uh, we do continue to meet periodically, and in fact, it's time to do another one. The, the process that we were trying to improve was data entry. Um, we've eliminated, we've changed the process so that we eliminated the backlog that we had, and I don't think that we will find ourselves in that with the backlog going forward. Um, we've been able to work with IT folks to come up with lots of automated checking that goes on uh, through those process improvements. We've eliminated some of the 
steps that were um, happening as documents came in the door and they were ready for data entry. Um, we hope to get to uh, just um, reducing a lot of paper and we've made some small steps in those regard in that regard um, at different increments. The latest was um, we get an annual report that's filed by public treasurers so that's due in April and we reminded them just this month that they should be getting ready to file that and um, we recommended that they email it then that email goes through the fresh desk and the document is there and it's extracted into our imaging system. So there's no actual paper that comes into the office. It uh, gets, um, has to be scanned and imaged. So that was the latest and now we're getting ready next month to receive um, lobbyist employer reports. So we'll be getting together again and trying to about getting ready for that and seeing if there's any steps that we can eliminate and relate to those reports. So it, it's ongoing. The, the other one that I'll add in, in there is that we're doing a pilot with basically scan and box. So we used to have a pretty lengthy process about moving papers around as they went from receive to scan to data entry to review. Um, so we're doing a pilot with just a couple form types where they go through the scanner and they go in a box and nobody touches the paper again and data entry is happening off screen. So they're actually using the essentially an electronic queue that shows all the documents that have been scanned but not entered and going through and doing the data entry directly off screen. So that removed a lot of the making piles, shuffling piles, rotating piles. You know, I forgot one of the things that I was supposed to mention in my report was that we do in January also send out requests to the House, uh, the Senate, and, um, and Lori will tell me what else, but asking for a list of their staffers so that we have a complete list of those who are required to file F1s, and we have been doing that. The governor's office, yeah, and we, um, you know, they're very busy with the session. We hope to have them here today we've got one of the three so far but we'll have them and the commission just looks at them um, so what we may end up doing is when we get all of them and send them out by email um, or keep it for February if you look at them and bless them in some <laughs> manner I guess any other questions for the director we'll move on to IT thank you Thanks for being here, James. I, uh, I won't rehash everything that's in my written report. Um, it highlights really the two biggest projects that are ongoing, the website, of course, and the lobbyist electronic filing application. And uh, the director and Ms. Anderson and myself are going to kind of collaborate on talking about the website at the end of the staff report, so I won't go over that one too much. Um, but. We're making great progress on the lobbyist electronic filing application, and it's been wonderful to have the high level of collaboration that we're getting from our customers. And so when they come here every two weeks um, and give us feedback about how to approach problems, um, and they're really helping us see the application in a very new light so that we're not just re-implementing existing practices, but really questioning how we're doing things. Um, and then really understanding what are the key features for them as well because the things that come to mind for us aren't what they're necessarily most interested in especially the things like just being able to import data that they already have rather than having to key that stuff in and being able to roll forward information from prior reports and pick which information so I want my compensation to carry forward but not necessarily all my expenditures so that's been been a really big benefit to that project that it's going very well so far. One thing that's not in my report that is related is that later on this afternoon the technical folks are actually presenting. There's an Olympia Drupal developers group that meets monthly and the staff participate in that almost every month. So they're going to be presenting the work that we've done on that application so far to that group later this afternoon. So we're pretty excited about that and proud of the work that they've been doing. And the only other thing I just wanted to mention that wasn't in my staff report is that 
and we're always looking for ways to do staff development and how to do that inexpensively. And so last month, um, you've all probably done some sort of Jung typology test, um, what's your, what's your uh, personality type. Um, and so we had all the staff do an online Jung typology test and then compiled those results and got together for a couple hours and talked about the attributes of those personality types really from the perspective of how does understanding how different people perceive and process information different from yourself, how does understanding that about them help you become a better communicator so that you can flex your communication style toward their way of thinking? And, and I think that was a big success and we got lots of positive comments from staff and I think you get a lot out of it. Jim, just a follow-up on the lobbyist input. It's great to make sure that we are using that across the board for other regulated communities. So no doubt everyone would like the ability to be able to just import data they've already put in and not have to rekey it or be able to update and all that. So as we you know as you move from stakeholder group to stakeholder, I hope we're carrying lessons learned to yeah, yes, ab absolutely. And one of the other things we're doing as we build this application is we're using it as a model for future work. And so we are building it in a modular way that once we figure out how to do an import, then we'll carry that forward into the next version. Um, the, the lobbyist application is kind of a TurboTax-esque flow, which was one of the other big things that we were asked about. And so that model about presenting this page of this type of information and the next page of the next um, we're also building in the same way so we can carry that forward into other applications. But the, the stakeholder input is a big part of that agile methodology. And that's why we have them as part of those two week iterations so we can show them what we did. Is this what you were expecting to have come out of it? What feedback do you have? <coughs> Here's what we're working on for the next iteration. What feedback do you have for us? This is how we're seeing it right now. Applying that information and just churning through that same process over and over again. Just on the uh, continuous learning, if we could be thinking of all the other users as stakeholders also, so the people, you know, we talked about the brief adjudicated hearings, when I listen to those, we hear a lot of issues that people raise about like they didn't understand the form or the website was confusing, or so that we're taking that and continuous learning, that as that stakeholder input about what's not working, or when we have some of the simple enforcement actions and people are saying, here's why I, so for the folks who are trying to comply and through all the conduits they have to the agency, when they raise issues or challenges for them that got in their way, that that's getting to you um, when it's IT related as ongoing system improvement. Because we do hear a lot from folks, right? Yeah, and I think, that, I think the place where we've done a lot of work, but we probably have a lot of room for improvement is making sure that when we get that feedback that it gets better memorialized, especially when it's not something that we're currently working on or we have a project that's pretty far off in the distance. And so um, I'll think a little bit more about how we do a better job of memorializing some of that so we actually do it when we get to the point of doing that work. Thank you. Do you want to turn to the website? Um, if, if Ms. Anderson was ready to go there, we can do that. So before you look at this, I want to give you some baseline expectations. One of the things that is very exciting about this is that every single aspect has come from work that we've done either with stakeholders or um, the analytics that we've been able to um, have available from Google on what the user interface is. A lot of time was spent initially coming up with user personas, you know, who are the people who are doing this and who are the people that we need to find solutions for. The one exception is um, something that Commissioner Levinson had just mentioned to me when we were talking about strategic planning was that the name of our agency isn't really helpful. If people don't know what Public Disclosure Commission does, to the extent that they guess, they usually think public records, not campaign finance candidates and lobbyists. So we've actually... Um, Yep, go there. Okay. So we've actually taken our name off the top. We say PDC regulating, what does it say? Regulating regulating candidates, campaigns, and lobbyists. 
So we're hoping even little things like that will be a help. The other thing that was uh, brought up regularly was for someone who's there to file, just give us a button. And so we have under the quick links, the first button is filing online. Uh, the other was um, we're really interested in new campaigns. You know, we want to get a snapshot uh, when we go to your website of who's filed what. And so we have right on the front page a listing of all of the new campaigns that will automatically populate throughout the day. Um, one of the goals here for me is to try to get people in the habit of checking regularly on our website for updated information. This is not set in stone. This is an artist's rendering of what it will look like. I think it is much cleaner and much better than anything we've had before. We can change some of it and some of it we will be changing. What Lori and James are working on right now is sort of the functionality piece of how does it work and does it work right. Um, so any thoughts you have would be welcome. Um, as with everything we do, you know, if we make any significant changes, there, there could be a cost driver. This has been a really impressive contract because we're able to get really a new website for $100,000 in three months. And let me tell you, in state government, that is unprecedented. So I feel very positive about this. I think it's a significant change. Is it perfect? No. Um, it's going to be something that we will work on and work on and work on some more. But that's the whole point of having it be on the Drupal platform. The Drupal platform is an open source software. We have experts in-house and then there's a world of expertise outside. <coughs> and anything that we want to do, we can go to that forum and say, have you ever done this kind of application? Have you ever done that? And we'll get people to say, yeah, I've done it. Here's an idea or here's something for you to use. So this is going to be a very dynamic, uh, very iterative. It will change over time and we'll be able to control it in a way that we have never been able to in the past. What else should we say? <laughs> Well, thank, thank you, and I think that's a great summary. Um, and, and again, yeah, you're, this is kind of awkward looking, and I'm give, it a, give it a try like this anyway. Um, but yeah, it's been a really iterative process, and sometimes it takes seeing something in action to have a better idea about how we might do it as well. Um, and just a couple things that, that I'll say right off the start. Um, the uh, vendor that we're working with has been really helpful in sort of pushing us towards ideas like the um, new campaigns list. They didn't know that campaigns was the thing, but what they knew was tell us something that you have that's going on on an almost daily basis. Something that will really draw people to want to come back and look at something. And so um, we looked at the campaign registrations and they are continuously coming in. And so at least once every few days we have new campaigns registering with us. And when they do, that's what will pop up in that space. And then we have the opportunity to add others as well. And so we can do the same thing with the um, enforcement cases because we have those coming up new and they can be added into a really similar type of list and we can decide whether or not to have those published to the homepage. And there's a lot of flexibility in the system to allow that. Um, there's some things also that uh, I'll, I'll say that I'm not entirely sold on either. Are you Are you on the homepage? So <clears throat> up at the very top there, you'll see learn, explore, engage, which are categories. And if you click one of those, it drops down to expose sort of how you navigate into the second level of items. And those menus are here in the footer. And, well, I should say, and on the real website, it there's an automatic drop into those items, but those items are also at the bottom. I, I tell you, I, those titles do not work for me. We've, me, we've, me, me either. We've been struggling with those titles. So instead of explore, the latest suggestion, so this, as Ellen said, was not set in stone. In fact, we've already made other suggestions to them. Instead of explore, we've asked to use the word browse. Um, under that tab would be another link into the da searchable database and the place where you can go and look at reports, um, search enforcement cases, which is already in the highlighted quick links, and then um, getting to into the authorities and some of the other things that we have, like graphs and charts and record setting campaigns. I think the, the difficulty we're having is um, from the data we've been given, it appeared that there were really three buckets that people 
wanted to have. And the first was, how do I figure out how to do stuff? You know, where are the manuals? Where's the instructions? Where's everything? The second is, let me get into the database and see what I can find about information. And then the third is, what's the commission doing? What's the agency doing? And we've been, it's ridiculous, but we have, and I can't tell you how many minutes I've spent trying to think of better words than these. So if you have any yeah, search, search. Well, the, and the, the only difficulty is search is, is going for the entire website. So it, so is research better? I know, you're doing a deep sigh. I feel that too. You know, I, I'm telling you, if this is $100,000, 50000 of it is right on this front page, okay? And it's got to work, and um, that doesn't work. Yeah, and, and I, I agree, and there's been a strong focus placed on how to figure out how to get the homepage to work for folks so that they're not digging around in layers and layers and layers. We've tossed around a couple ideas about is it possible to use graphics that are associated with those labels to help bring the idea across or subheadings that go along with them to help bring the ideas across. And so this is still a work in progress and, and I think that we'll come up with something that will work better. And maybe um, we've boxed ourselves in by trying to come up with one word buttons. I mean, maybe it's just, maybe it is, you know, I just want to go yeah. back to, I know he was from a while ago, but viewer steps right at the top, buttons that are what you're, I need to file, instead of layers, you are exploring page. Regardless of what the words are, it's an extra step to have to think through something that's not intuitively what you're looking for. So are you reacting to the fact that it's at the top? Because we've got the quick links right, right below. If we dropped those... We need something that, that takes people into our realms of information. You know, I'm still an advocate for the <coughs> version that is right on the home page, the buttons of what you're going to direct, so that graphic is sure that you have the users taking them in directly without multiple layers or things, mm -hmm. just the, you know, the way private sector websites are tending yeah, one of the things we've really struggled with with that is the wide variety of things that, that are there and how people look at it from different perspectives. And so, you know, we tried applying and thinking about an audience based model, but because our audiences also have these very diverse interests, even um, somebody who's in a campaign actually doesn't want to do just things that you might think about as a candidate, but they want to do other things. And of course, the, the folks in the press want to see everything. And so this has been a huge part of our effort. Um, it was one of the things we really stressed in looking for a vendor to do the work was their capability to look at what we have and our users and do that analysis and talk to the people about what they needed. Um, and I think we're getting closer. Um, but I think we still have a ways to go. And then the other um, idea, and this started with something that you had brought up as well, uh, Commissioner Levinson, about sort of this idea that I, I want to do a particular thing. Um, it has some difficulty for us as well, of course, because of the broad, if you give somebody a list of 800 things to do, that also becomes cumbersome for them. But I was talking just yesterday to a friend of mine who does user interface design work, um, and she suggested a couple of things that I'm also going to talk to the vendor about, about how we can do some sort of um, maybe expert assistance um, instead of digging down into buckets that could be, I don't want to clutter the home page, and of course finding that balance is always hard too, but maybe some sort of expert assistance where, you know, I'm interested in, and then there's a couple of key areas do what do I need to do because I'm a candidate um, and try to figure out maybe some of the language from the stakeholder work that we did that might key us in on some of those things so we can catch the new folks because the folks that come all the time um, they're going to figure out where things are as, as long as we make it easy for them to figure out which bucket to go in but especially for somebody new coming in to be able to just I just need to know did I hit the right website because I'm a new candidate and I don't even know really why I'm here, so what do I need to know? 
Um, so I thought that was a great suggestion from her, and I'm going to have that discussion with the vendor. Well, well, and I think that's been one of the difficulties too, is that when we look at this and say, well, if I am a new candidate, is this immediately helpful? And it may not be. I mean, probably the most helpful tool up there is the search button at the top. Um, there's also a search um, query sign on the left-hand side of it um, to just say, you know, file a report or whatever it may be. Um, but it, it's been it's been an interesting um, discussion to try to think through. You know, what do you have on the website so that you don't have what we currently have, which is just too much of everything. But what are the important elements, and how do you make them usable? As James and I think Evelyn have both said, that month of user research that we did, plus our own little un, very unscientific survey that we did before we ever got into um, even writing the proposal, told us that there are really three categories of what people come to our website for. And one was to do something because they are engaging in campaigning, so they have to file something. They want the information that has been collected out of those reports. They, and they want to see what the commission is doing, including enforcement. So that was the purpose of trying to make those what we're calling buckets on the home page. And if you click one of those things, you go into another menu. And if you, when you actually get to that landing page, then you would see the how do I kind of activity. Um, what would. I'm, I'm sorry, Lord, but it, you got to get there faster. You just do. You know. So the people who know what they're coming for. We've tried to address that right here in these quick links. They can file right now, click here, and it takes them in to a filing application. They can track enforcement right here. They, if they click that, they get the summary of all the complaints that we've received. And there's a new feature that we don't have right now, which is the PDC calendar that would have all events on it from commission meetings to filing deadlines to whatever else is going on that should be on the actual calendar. Well, um, and let me ask, would it, is part of it that that's not prominent enough? Do, tell, yeah. tell me a little bit about what, what you need, because your feedback is really valuable. I think you described correctly, you know, what, what do people come here for? So we've got, you know, we have the people that have to do business with us, lobbyists, candidates, committees, and other mandatory filers, perhaps not the doctors, mm -hmm. people like us. Mm -hmm. okay. um, you know, we need something up there that grabs, here's what you do. Here's your place. Here's, your, here's how you can plug in. And, and then the, the next one is people don't, the public who wants to search, whether it's the media or individuals or, you know, people that do opposition research or, you know, all the other things that have done in campaigns. Um, citizens that want to just look, boom, oh, here's how you go about doing this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't see anything, if, if I was just looking to see, uh, I wanted to search a campaign like uh, contributions, mm -hmm. am I looking at track enforcement? No, I'm looking no at you're looking at search all campaigns. So that you're, what I'm hearing is these words don't mean, yeah, don't tell you it's what like that. Campaigns, though. I look at that, I go, and that's just for new campaigns. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's not useful. Mm -hmm. I can't stress enough how important it is to get this right. Well, we know. I mean, it, it, we know. It's really hard to get the money to do this. And, I'm, and this is the first time we've seen it, and i got to tell you, I'm not satisfied. Mm -hmm. Okay. So just to keep building. On this, so the, I know we've talked about that. Just thinking of the words in terms of the user, not in terms of us. And so that um, I don't know what track enforcement means when I look at that. I, and PVC calendar. When I mentioned that, what I was looking for to be prominent was critical dates that I need to know about, right? Not necessarily the PVC calendar. Like my, like what's the so 
critical filing dates or important. So what do I need to know about when the F1 is due or when my campaign committee, you know, is it three weeks before election day? What's, so again, I wouldn't necessarily think of that as PDC calendar, right? Mm -hmm. So just then the same about the, um, you know, I feel the same way as Grant. What I like across the top is you know, elected officials, lobbyists. So it's the user, right? right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that we capture those groups right off the top. And then everybody else who's searching the whole database, I get that that's a different field, but the yeah. regulated community, we have buckets of regulated community, lobbyists and campaign treasury. Yeah. So does it make sense to have buttons that speak to those user groups so they can dive right in with that? Or do they need too many different? Yes. And just thinking off the top of my head. And, and I think part of the problem is the wording. It's really tough to understand what the wording is supposed to mean. Um, and I wrote down the same words that you used, Commissioner Levinson, and I don't think it's the right word for the website, but I think it gets us close to what we need to be thinking about. Um, and that first bucket really is all about the regulated community. Um, if the label was a regulated community, I don't think that would get me there no, if I was talking as a candidate. No, I'm talking right. about the, the customers within the regulated community. We have a half a dozen buckets of those. And saying to them, you know, having them be able to go and say, I am a lobbyist. I think this is where you're going. This is the path. So go back, Lori, to the one that shows the menus disclosed. <laughs> and this menu isn't in any um, order that we've determined that it will be final in well, the final version. Yeah. Oh, and I guess I'll, I'll add that. And so what you're seeing is artists' renderings of the home page and some drop down pages, which is good because that's why we're coming to you at this point to say, give us your reaction. And I am not in any way dismayed that your reaction is, oh, that is not what I was hoping for. But give us that feedback, because this is the point where we can start using it. I couldn't be more out of <laughs> No, you're, you're being very clear, and I appreciate that clarity. But, but let me tell you this. So in order to have meaningful feedback, you've got to have something to react to. It would not have been helpful to have a blank page and say, what do you want in a website? You have to have something sitting up there to say, that's not what I want, or that piece is OK. So this conversation is really important to us. Um, so. Uh, again, just kind of thinking off the top of my head, um, when we think about audiences, because we have so many audiences, to just list the audiences on the home page, I'm a lobbyist, I'm someone who employs lobbyists, I, and, and it goes on and on, would make the home page really cluttered and probably would lead to more confusion. The way that they're envisioning these buckets working is, they're not a quick wait for the web page to load, but rather they're all there on the web page. They're just hidden until you go to that item. You click on the item and they're instantaneous so that people aren't waiting for the next page to load. And you can explore by just click, click, click and be very fast. But I think that the first label, not regulated community, but there's something else there. And it's something along the lines of IMA and Maybe what shows up in that bucket is where we list out all the potential customer classes so that they can click on that and we show them the things that are probably most likely for them to be interested in. And maybe the second bucket really is something more along the lines of public information. Um, so it makes it more clear that this is about coming here and learning about what I need to do. And this is about coming here to learn about all the things that the PDC can do for me. And maybe the third one's a little bit more about, so let me learn about the commission and how the commission operates and when the meetings are, which is a lot of what is in that engage bucket, as well as maybe contacting staff and asking questions. Um, but I think it getting better labels on those and then understanding what goes in those categories that for me, I think when, I, when somebody clicks, whatever it ends up being called that's under learned, their eye should immediately gravitate toward 
yeah, it's pretty darn close to that. This is the place that I want to go. And you don't actually have to click those buttons to see what's under the in that category. If you scroll down to the bottom of the home page, they're all listed there. And I'll, I'll tell you my struggle with coming up with um, na this kind of navigation stream has really been I'm one foot here and I'm one foot in the old website because when we developed this one, we wanted to help lead filers to where they needed to be. So we categorized all the filers, we gave them this list, and we said, you know, here you go, these are your resources because you are a candidate or a lobbyist. What I have found through helping people try to navigate our website is I don't need to be a lobbyist or it's not just lobbyists who want to know what the lobbyist requirements are. Other people want to know too so that they know when the next report is due or they know um, they're thinking about being a lobbyist or they're um, trying to figure out what's happening on a particular bill and so they want to know what the PDC has to um, collect it from lobbyists. So it's almost as if we need two websites, one for the regulated community and one for people who want to follow all of that information. And trying to come up with um, one website that suits both of those audiences has been really a struggle for, for me personally. So we were, um, in designing it this way, we were trying to say that here's all the information that we have for the regulated community. And when they click on that page and they land, there will be a specific landing page and it will point the categories of filers to different areas. But it will also just have all the things that I know that people want to know even when they're not the regulated community, like when is the next report due and what are contribution limits. So these are reporting tools. These are reporting tools. That's a little bit easier to understand than where where it could be. It's just so bad. It's, yeah. The wording the wording <coughs> needs some work. Um, and then the other thing about the calendar, and, and I made a note to myself that we need to push back a little bit about the labeling about calendar versus understanding dates. But one of the really neat things about um, what we're doing implementation wise is all the various kinds of events have other metadata to go with them. Or is it a commission meeting? Is it a training? And a lot of emphasis is being placed on the search functionality. So when you go to the calendar, um, the intent, of course, we don't, the work isn't done and we have a budget and the timeline, but the intent is to have check boxes or something to that effect to turn on and off the kinds of things that you're interested in. So I just want to see the training, or I just want to see the commission meetings, or I just want to see due dates. Um, and then those will appear or disappear from the calendar based on the criteria that you select. And all of our content is being um, developed with the, our audience of regulated community in mind. So the lobbyists will have one set of information. So if they, they can go to the calendar and they can see all the lobbyist filing deadlines and the campaigns have a different set of information that will be that they can filter from everything else when they get beyond the home page. Are you discussing having some scroll somewhere that just has the most critical upcoming dates? So in addition to what you just said, something on the home screen that says lobbyist next report due March 1. Um, yes so, and no. Um, this featured content section, which is the next thing below the um, candidate registrations, is something that any piece of content that we put in the website has a flag on it that Lori or whoever in her staff, when they decide that they want something to become part of that, they just click a checkbox in that content and it shows up there. And so when we put out a note that says we're going to do some particular activity, we're looking for stakeholder input, 
or a filing deadline is coming due, uh, along with that piece of content, we click Featured Content, and then it shows up in that section of the website. So what I'm hearing is that the Music Commission wants the website to be all things to all people at all times. And what we're working towards is being most things to most people at most of the time, which I think is a really good thing. Um, I appreciate the work that's being done. I think it's very important to keep people in the loop that actually have the verbiage because they're the ones that are using it, like brand new campaigns or, you know, to find those words that we are all struggling with because we know we speak PDC and they haven't learned to speak PDC yet. So, um, again, the DMV licensing website does two different things and they do it fairly well. We have to be from kindergarten to PhD and that's such an expansive amount of not only information but ways to um, relay the information that it is exponentially more difficult for us. All that to say, I really appreciate the comments and everything that's said today. We're half an hour behind schedule. I so appreciate the work that's being done here. And I think if anyone has any more feedback, could they get it back to James or Lori so that we're not an hour behind? Because we could, I personally could discuss this all afternoon because there's so many different ways to look at different things. Well, you know, we, I won't overpromise, but we could do a special meeting by phone and maybe get this out to everyone, you know, so you can look at it on your computers and we can have a discussion over the phone too. Mm -hmm. um, or the next iteration of it. But what I'm hearing that is very significant to me is, come on, seriously, there's got to be a way for campaigns and candidates and lobbyists to just go straight and not have to figure this out. And words aside, I think there's a way to do that. We've got some flexibility on our quick links. That might be an option. I mean, I, I think there's some way we can do that. Top third of the page. <laughs> okay. Well, um, what do you think about how the page is structured? with the quick links here in the center and what we hope will drive people to our website here every day, kind of down near the bottom here, at, at the bottom, at the bottom, first half, and then this featured content down here where you actually have to scroll down. I'm sorry for taking time off. This may be one of the most important things. No, that you we're take your time okay. and be we, have, we, we struggled to get the money to do this. Mm -hmm. We have to deliver it. It has to be done right. And so uh, we have to make, uh, we have to deliver something that is very, far more functional than we have today. Um, we've got to focus on providing the services to the regulated community. I mean, if you have to prioritize, mm -hmm. and we all have to right. have to prioritize, okay. you've got to deliver the goods to the regulated community and, and, and to the public. And the new stuff about featured content and what's hot and new and can that's sort of the nice to haves the need to haves are you know how do I improve the the file the the, the uh, experience for the filers okay and get that information in and produced in a in a in a good way so that we that improves the in, in the, the back of house functions and it also improves the the, the experience for everybody that does the file. The second piece of it is how do we improve the search, the searching mechanisms? Because that's what we've been hearing from the public where they've had difficulty. Those are the two most important things. The other stuff, it's all cute, but it's less important. It's just less important. So if that's if that's I mean, if you're asking me to prioritize and what it is to be everything to everybody, it, it, that's the prioritization I would recommend. And for the same reason. So this this I understand why the consultant might be thinking new and fresh and you want things so people can check every day. I don't want people to have to check every day, number one. <laughs> number two, I want to base it on what our analytics tell us people are trying to do with our website. So unless you're telling me that more people are trying to find out about new campaigns than are trying to file. Um, well, James said the consultant, but that's something I've heard from the media year after year. How can I easily find who's filed that day? Who's filed, who's started? their campaign that day with you. And then when our um, 
on-site contractor was here and did user experience work with our the people who volunteered to participate one of the folks that came into that meeting said well you know there's something that the city of seattle does on their ethics and elections website where they have this feed of filings that happened that day so that's where we were coming from even if that turns out to be where you want to go calling it new campaigns to me is is this where I go as a new campaign to file? Is this where I write as opposed to um, recently filed campaign or something? And so that you're making it clear again on all of these words that there's a real purpose for that. And if you're saying that the data shows that people, media or others, really want to log on with some frequency, but for me, a goal is not driving people to the website. The goal is getting the website to work first. You know, in the future, we can work on driving people to it, but I wouldn't put that ahead of getting it to work for people who have to use it. Okay. Um, and the words are easy to change. We just have to come up with the right words. Very helpful. Yeah, and um, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll just say this quickly. Some of the functionality, like being able to show the new candidate registrations is an artifact of work that we're doing to make other functionality work better. And so, you know, ultimately, I think the, the single biggest goal we could have is that you come to our website, you go to the box that says search, you type in the thing that you want, and you get the result that you're after. Um, and so, I, I, I really don't want to overpromise because we have a tight budget and a tight timeline, but the driving factor behind being able to put the campaigns there is that once that's working, if you go to the search box and you type in Inslee, one of the things that you will get is the candidate registration for Inslee and the various election years with a link that takes you to the data page that shows all the expenditures, a link to show the C1 and the full registration, and a link to all the reports right from there. And so we really are driving around that idea of being able to bring that to the forefront come type in what you're interested in and get the result that you're looking at. Because we know that over 90% of the current traffic is people that are coming that are searching through various records, generally campaign and committee information. Thank you very much. And we did, do we have a process moment? What's the, What's we, the plan? We had talked when we started, and I think maybe some of the angst is we had talked when we started about sort of as each phase, before anything gets in stone, can I come back because this is really a priority of the commission? So, what's the way? What's the touch base going forward? So everybody feels comfortable. What's the What's the time frame? I mean, what What are your pieces that are coming up, and we can plan around that? So we're working in two week iterations with the vendor. They're actually doing agile development the same way that we do. Um, we are ending the current iteration at the end of this week. And at the end of the iteration that follows, I think we'll have quite a bit more stuff to show. Um, and that you in agreement with that, Lori? Yeah, I think we'll have landing pages out of the next at the end of the next two weeks. And so um, maybe we should just do a special meeting, and we can do it over the phone and make sure that everyone has access, or we distribute screenshots if that's where we are. Um, and have the discussion because it's been really valuable to to hear feedback and especially because you haven't seen it as it's rolled out um, I think it makes it even better that you have sort of that initial reaction so can you tell me briefly what is in stone and what's um, like the top three words are, are there is three uh, buckets uh, no, well, I know the words are words stone, stone. but are the bucket like could we have four buckets could, yeah is the number in stone? It's I don't. I don't know how hard it would be that for them to change from three to four. That's, but it's probably medi medium-ish. The words are easy peasy level stuff. <coughs> Until a certain point, because these do drive our file structure. Nope. I had them take that out. That? Yeah, and I, one of the things that recently I had them do is remove the dependency on what those labels are. So that if we hate the words in a year because we get feedback from customers that say, this is crazy, I can't figure it out, we can change the labels and not have things break going down the road. Um, so we can find out if we can, if there are, you know, 
let's say, four buttons, because I, I am somewhat taken with the idea of, you know, being really straightforward, just have a button for campaign slash candidates and another button for lobbyists. Because I don't think it would be that hard for someone who wants to know about campaigns to click that button either. Oh, I like the idea of putting that in the quick links. That might work in the quick links too. You, you also might think about the, asking the question. Remember, it's putting it in the words of the user instead of us. So even search you might say, what are you trying to do? Or what would you like to do? Or some, you're trying to invite them in and make it as easy for them. Yeah, we're really battling with that two audience uh, issue and, and what Commissioner Degginger was saying about making sure that we're serving the people, the, the regulated community. And one of the uh, user exercises that we did with stakeholders was about gathering terminology and understanding the words that they speak with. And of course, we're working with the group of people that have a strong interest in our website. They're people that already know about it and they have a very different lingo than the person that's filing for their first campaign. So again, we're struggling with that balance of experts who know all about us and love us and folks who are, who are here for the first time. And to the chair's point, I don't want to have anyone to have to speak PDC. I don't want to have PDC as a language, right? Mm -hmm. So it should work for you. And just another one of my pet peeves concerning websites in general is not being able to find contact information. I just want to it's right on the home page. That's at the bottom. There's no phone number there. Yeah, yeah, it's over here on the right column. Oh. Um, both phone numbers and our fax number and the email address. So many websites don't even have a phone number. And we have our address there too. Is there a way that you folks can email back to us? Yes. I'd like that. Yes, we will do that. Very helpful. We are a little bit short on time because so your suggestion on how to. Um, I have passed out the um, case status reports from the enforcement team. What I'm going to suggest is that you take it with you, and I will follow up in my um, weekly report with the details of when these matters are scheduled. We also have Linda here for executive session. So what I'm going to suggest is that we skip the enforcement report and I send it to you with my um, weekly update and that you move into your executive session to get a briefing on um, litigation. Is there anything we need to desperately need to know, Lori, for customer service? No. Thank you. Yes. Before we leave the enforcement just want to reemphasize we do want to get this in advance with meeting materials so we have time to go over it so we can yes. have the commission meetings prepared to discuss and you will um, we have now moved everything into our fresh desk system and that was the delay so you will not have multiple um, excel spreadsheets in the future you will have something like this although we can customize it to get uh, different columns on it and we're looking to reinstate the columns about when to schedule the type of hearing I think what I would say to that is, yes, we are looking to add a column that does not currently pull data from Freshdesk, so we're going to have to think about whether we need to put data into Freshdesk to pull it, or whether I'm essentially taking a pulled report and customizing it once it's pulled. Um, and I just, you know, for your information, I'm saying me because I'm now the supervisor of the enforcement team. Um, Susan is here definitely through the end of February and then sort of phasing out. Um, we don't have an open position to hire a director of compliance in, so we're going to be doing everything under my direction for a period of time, uh, and we're going to keep this as our highest priority. So because we're 45 minutes late, we have an executive session with Linda, and then we're supposed to have a working lunch that we're going to lunch is where? Working lunch is down at the Water Street Cafe, which is um, out the back door and across the street. And then are we supposed to come back here to adjourn? Or um, we had initially anticipated that you'd have your executive session, come back in here, adjourn, 
and we'd go and do our working lunch and then our afternoon work session on strategic plan. I think we can also come back here after lunch and adjourn. That would be fine too. We are coming back here for a work session this afternoon on the strategic plan. Yeah, we're going to be in the IT training room. So this time we will um, head to executive session for approximately 20 minutes and then to our working lunch and return here by 1 o'clock to adjourn. Correct. Did you say afternoon or adjourn after lunch? Yes. Just don't say it's back at 1 and we're going somewhere else for lunch. We've got to be back at 1 to make the work session work. So we're going to, we will work with the people down at the restaurant. Yeah. Thank you.